Great, thank you everyone and welcome back. Um, today we have, in looking at your screen, on the left hand of your screen, we have Olympian Michael Andrew, and to his right is Olympian Chase Kalish. Um, so as we've done today, if you could please raise your hand and we will get to you um, with our questions. And if you could just announce yourself, your outlet, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, we will start with the first question to Dan Moriarty. Hi, Chase. This is uh, Dan Moriarty with CNN Sports. Um, you, you've overcome a lot in life from, from being in a coma as a kid to dealing with a shoulder injury a couple of years ago and now making your second Olympic team. Uh, how, do, how do you hope your journey will inspire somebody watching these Olympics? Um, I don't really know. I, I guess I haven't really put too much thought um, into really that aspect of it or how it might affect people. Uh, for me, um, I mean, my story is not really finished. Um, and, and there's still things that I want to accomplish and still things that I want to do. And there's, there's many obstacles I had to overcome this year. Um, some help aside, some not. So um, I'm kind of just taking it step at a time. Um, I'm, right now in my career, uh, what I take pride in is, is doing everything correctly. Um, taking pride in my training, um, doing everything recovery-wise correctly, and um, really just, just mentally and physically um, trying to put myself in the best place possible. Um, I'm a little older than I was last time, so th those things are a little more important for me right now. Um, so that's really my mindset, um, how it's been for the last two years, um, very much so the last year, and um, even more so these last final steps as we proceed towards the games. We'll have the next question from Karen. Hi, um, this is for Chase. Chase, um, a two-part 400 IM question. So because it's one of the most difficult events, does the crowd noise palpably help you and so is the news today that there will be no crowds a bummer for you and then secondly the fact that you will now not be swimming the 400 im final on technically the same day as the prelim because of the flip-flop schedule is that actually helpful to not have to technically swim the try the prelim and final the same day yeah um i guess i'll probably start with the second part of that um, you know, we, we did one meet, um, I, I think it was, it was the California Board of Mission Viejo, um, meet where we did, we flip-flopped the schedule, and it was a little different, um, but at the end of the day, racing is racing, and, um, the Olympics more so than any other meet is, is you need to be ready when your, when your time is called, and when, when the gun goes off for your race, and I think managing that, and if, mentally is is probably the biggest aspect and i don't really think it's going to be so much different than um say a normal traditional prelims finals meet um i mean i remember asking when, when we were really young um i can remember the exact practice it was, it was a kick set and i was kicking next to michael i had to have been 14 or 15 and, and i was asking them those exact questions um about 2008 in, in that scenario before we even had any idea that we would ever have a meet like that ever again um, just curiosity. And uh, I, I think Michael says the best is, um, you know, it's, it's, you're in the moment um, and you have to be ready for it. And um, like I said, racing's racing. And, and that's kind of really how I've proceeded forward to it. Um, not really too much. I think when you start thinking um, so much of how's my body going to react? How's the night's sleep going to react? Am I better at night or in the morning? I think that's when things start to get more difficult and it starts to complicate things. Um, so that's really my mindset moving forward. I, I, I don't think it's going to be as big of an obstacle as, as some say. Um, would you mind repeating the first part of that question, Karen? Um, the first part was the 400 IM is such a difficult race. It, it, it seems like one that when you do hear the crowd noise, they can really carry you to the finish. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering if that's so, and if it is so, is it, how disappointing is it to know that you will be um, racing in a silent venue? Well, I mean, I think it is disappointing to hear. Um, obviously, 
um, this is something that's out of my control and, and all of our control. And um, we certainly understand and respect the decision of, of why that's going to be the case. Uh, 4am is it's a long race and you can certainly hear the crowd noise. Um, I personally, I love hearing the crowd noise when I'm behind. I think back to 2017, um, my first 200 of my 4 a.m. and when I came off that wall and really started to pull ahead on the breaststroke, I could really hear the crowd. Um, and I kind of knew I was doing something special there. Um, so I, I personally love the crowd. I love the noise. Um, I love having packed arenas. But I've been swimming. So swimming's a pretty solo sport. Um, we spend most of our time in isolation by ourselves. Um, and there's a good bit of it you can't really even hear much. You can hear the occasional you're popping up on your breaststroke. So um, I don't really think it personally is going to be a big factor. Um, like I said, it is disappointing, and I wish it wasn't the case, but it's understanding. But um, as far as how it's going to affect the race, I, for me, I don't, I don't really see it making much of an impact. Christine, go ahead. Hi to you both. Thanks uh, for doing this. Christine Brennan with USA Today. Uh, for Michael, Michael, you know, vaccines are in the news, obviously, uh, much discussed all the time. And uh, I'm curious, are you fully vaccinated or not? And if not, why not? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question, Christine. Um, so yes, I, I'm not fully vaccinated. I'm not vaccinated. Um, and my reason behind it is I, for one, it was a, kind of a last moment. I didn't want to put anything in my body that I didn't know how I would potentially react to. Um, you know, as an athlete on the elite level, everything we do is very, uh, very calculated and understood. And um, for me in the training cycle, especially leading up to trials, I didn't want to risk any days out because um, we do know that there were periods where, you know, take the vaccine and you have to deal with some, some days off. But as far as that goes, um, USA Swimming and all of us here have been through very strict protocol with lots of testing, masks, um, socially distant, obviously staying away from the crowds, everything like that. Um, and going into Tokyo, the same thing with testing every day. So we feel very safe and um, protected knowing that there's, you know, we're minimizing risk as much as possible. But personally, I, I have not uh, had the vaccine yet um, and, and don't plan on in the distant future. So. We'll see as things go forward. Thanks. Karen, go ahead. This is a question for Michael. What is it like for you as a newcomer, a first-time Olympian, um, knowing that you're in the 400 medley relay mix um, and trying to extend a legacy where the U.S. has never lost that Olympic gold when they've competed? Um, do former um, relay members, um, re have they reached out to you? Do you feel as if it's not just the four or six or eight of you, but you know everybody who's done that event before you that is part of this um, relay in Tokyo? Yeah, that's, that's an amazing question. Um, thank you. And so it's, it is, it's an honor. Um, you know, going into trials, I knew that you know, winning the breaststroke would put me in a, a very favorable position uh, for that relay. And you know, there's an incredible legacy beyond the relays, but just in USA Swimming in general with our, our relay prowess. And so it's, it's pretty cool to know that I now get to be a part of that in the present. Um, and looking back at the athletes past, you know, there's some, some pretty incredible names, some incredible swims that have gone down. And so I'm just doing everything I can to show up and be the fastest on the day for the team. And I think that's one thing that's so exciting for me is I, growing up, really didn't have an opportunity to do relays on the regular um, because I was a, a one-man team with my dad as my coach. And so, you know, every world champ trip, every Olympic trip now, there's an opportunity to do that. So we've been working really hard on our relays. Um, I've been speaking with a few of the, the guys here um, that are here on the team with us that have experienced this. and nothing but encouraging words and with all the coaching staff, you know, they, they're doing everything to prepare me for that moment. And I put the work in and I'm, I'm very much just ready to, to let that work do the talking. Um, but just following up again with 
the fact that the relay is undefeated for just ever, I guess, is uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, but nothing that I would want to shy away from as a, as a first time Olympian. Oh. Izumi, go ahead. Hi, this is Izumi from TV Asahi. I have two questions, but I'm ask uh, Chase first. Um, I'm sorry to be the one that I always ask you about this, but how excited are you to go head to head again with Daya in 400 IEM? And how confident are you to bring back the title back to the United States? Um, very excited. Uh, like I've mentioned throughout the years, me and Daya have now raced for maybe 10 plus years in international competitions from our junior team days. Um, I know my first world championships was his first world championships. Um, and we've gone back and forth throughout the years. Um, he's an incredible racer. He's, he's one of my good friends and um, someone I respect very much. Um, it, it's a unique opportunity where I'm racing him in his home country. And, and I can only imagine um, what an honor it is to have a, an Olympic Games in your home country. Um, I don't know if that adds to any pressure or any calming ability for him um, in that aspect. Um, I can just tell you, um, personally going into it um, with kind of, not, I don't really want to say difficult, um, but a little bit of off, I guess, year or two, um, overcoming a few things and, and kind of really finding myself again in this sport. Um, I will be ready to race my, to my 100% ability, whatever that is. Um, I will give 100% effort. Um, I will kill myself in that race. Um, regardless of the outcome, I, I will use everything I have in that race. And I'm very much looking forward to it day one. Matthew, go ahead. Hi, Matt DeGeorge from Swimming World. Uh, this is for Chase. Uh, I wonder, as a veteran on this team, obviously there's some big names who were there in Rio, like Michael and Ryan and Nathan, who aren't there now. I wonder what, as a second teamer, you feel like the role is for you as a leader, as a swimmer in the pool. Uh, what's that dynamic like as one of the veterans in this group? Um, this is really the first time that I've really felt like one of the, the older ones, and in the, I know I'm, I'm 27, I, I guess it is one of the older ones on the team, but I, I mean, I've been on trips with guys that are 30 years plus, so um, they're going into it, I didn't necessarily really feel like I was going to be one of the older ones. And, um, I guess I, I hang out with Ryan Murphy a good bit, and we sit around talking about it, but it's, it really is the first time that it's kind of just, wow, um, I think this is maybe my ninth consecutive national team trip um, or, or eighth. Um, my first world championships was when I was, I think, 18 in 2013. And I've, I've been here ever since. Um, it's, it's a little different. It, it definitely is different. I, I remember being the, like the wide-eyed young kid running around with endless energy. Like I, I see some of these uh, younger guys on the team now and, and just their pure excitement. And um, now I'm, I go to practice and, and try to recover and um, mentally reset for my next workout um, type of guy. And um, kind of the extracurricular activities are kind of toned down on my aspect. Um, it's, it's, it's been a very eye-opening experience. And it's, it's really cool for me to see it really come full circle to kind of see the guys that are here now where I was and um, kind of think back at how I thought of the older guys when I was their age. So um, I'm definitely enjoying this trip um, kind of with a different perspective. Dan, go ahead. This is a question. Michael, um, how will competing in your first Olympics validate everything that you've done, that there are more than one way to reach this stage? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, so for me, I never came into this. I never had the Olympic dream to, to try and validate um, the way my family had done things. Um, it is interesting to see how naturally it's turned into that. Um, you know, there's a lot of stories about 
the fact that we did everything differently, um, and you know, we, we've prided ourselves on that. You know, we chose a, a path. We went very much family forward. Um, mom is my agent, dad is my coach. Um, our training methodology is very different. We race a lot, and so it is cool to finally be at this point and for people to see that all those years of hard work um, and the fact that we can do it differently makes sense. Um, you know, I, I think it's an exciting opportunity for me to be able to replicate and, and present this on the Olympic stage. Um, I'm going to be pushing out an MA Swim Academy post Olympic Games. Um, and really, this is an opportunity for me to give back through the decade of being a professional athlete, almost a decade of being a professional athlete, that you know, what we've learned and discovered along the way is we want to give those tools and resources to everybody else. And I think that's more what's fulfilling for me is that this is an opportunity and a huge platform to now show and to speak and to educate and help um, versus just keeping it all for ourselves. Um, but beyond that, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting to, to finally be able to say, I am an Olympian and to know that we've done it different than most Olympians in the past. Elliot, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Elliot Almond at the San Jose Mercury News. Um, Chase or Michael, you, either one who wants to address this, I'd love to hear from you. Um, Japan um, is throwing up a lot of roadblocks for all of us trying to get there. And it feels like that we're the unwanted house guests coming to a party that they don't want. And I know there's a party line like you just got to worry about what you're doing, worry about your racing, but this is going to be an Olympics that's unlike any of the 12 or whatever others I've covered in the past. And I'm just wondering, like, is there just a creeping sense like, gosh, they don't want us? Like, usually J Japan are fantastic fans and go nuts over you guys. And I'm just wondering what your th if there's any thoughts about that. Thank you. Um, I think if we look back at the history of USA Olympic athletes and specifically USA swimming, um, we've, we have a culture of overcoming things. Um, we have a very strong culture of um, proving people wrong, rising to the occasion, um, and, and doing everything right. I, I can tell you that there's, there's really one person here that is going in here with the mindset of that they don't want us here. Um, and I don't really necessarily think that any of the Japanese citizens specifically don't want us there. I think that the Japanese citizens as a whole understand the scope of the pandemic going on and in the situation and that their lives at risk. And I, I think if anything, that's really motivating their decision for disdain towards this Olympic games. I, I don't think anyone really is saying we don't want us athletes here. And I don't think anyone should really have that perspective. Um, like I touched on previously, we, we totally understand how they feel about that. Um, but at the end of the day, I, it, the games are going on and we have a job to do. And I, I think everyone here specifically at USA Swimming has done such a great job of really blocking out that because there's really nothing that we can do about it. Um, yeah. we're, we're leaving for the games on Monday and we're going to be there um, ready to compete. So um, that's what we're here to do. Yeah, I think Chase touched on that perfectly. Um, really, I echo all the points he added. And I think when you speak with the athletes here, there's just a massive sense of gratitude. And a lot of that started with the fact that we could even have an Olympic trials. You know, I was prepared early 2021 to not even have an Olympic Games this year. You know, it looked like at a point it was going to be canceled again. And um, like Chase says, we're here and we're all prepared, ready to race. It is unfortunate that, you know, doors are a little more closed, but we understand that. It's all because of safety and, and the fear that revolves around the pandemic. And I, I think I'd like to say that um, I don't think anyone's here with the mindset of that we're going to be out and about and, and cause any extra issues. Um, we're all prepared to be safe. We're all prepared to be locked down and we're all prepared to go to the pool and go back to our rooms and do nothing else. Um, but like I said, at the end of the day, we're, we're here for our job. Craig, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, um, yeah, uh, Craig Lord. Um, hi, um, a question for Michael. Um, I know that everybody swims in, you know, swims in their own lane and 
you have to just have your own goals and all the rest of it. Um, we hear that from a lot of you. But nonetheless, you're in a race where some guy has done a 56.8. Um, and I just wondered, how do you approach that? Are you just kind of look, not looking at him? Or um, do you think a 56.8 possible, a 56 swim from you? How do you approach that whole race um, when you have someone of that kind of enormity in the water? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, no, so Mr. Petey, Adam Petey is, you know, he's a legend in the sport. He's in a very good spot. You know, he's, he's comfortable. He's sitting pretty at the top. Um, but I, like you said, and as the athletes kind of reiterate is, I understand for me to have my best performance, I cannot swim Adam's race. I must swim my own race. And there's some things we've been working on and what I know about my performance and what I'm capable of that I didn't quite hit at trials. Um, so we believe there's more in the tank. And I'm excited to do everything I can to, to reveal that on the Olympic stage. And if it's enough on the day to claim gold, obviously we go in there with the task of always winning. I'm not gonna ever show up to a race thinking, man, Adam's so far ahead, he's unbeatable. I think that's the first mistake any athlete in that final could make is to think that we, you know, we, every opportunity to swim, the fact that we have a lane in that final, if you are fortunate enough to get to that final, you've got a chance at goal. Um, nobody knows what can happen and, and we're going to show up ready to race. So that's where I'm at with that. Thanks. Karen, go ahead. Chase, I have another 400 IM question for you. You talked about how the U.S. teams have overcome things in the past. So the very first gold medalist um, in the 400 IM had an appendicitis attack um, before he swam prelims. And he said that it weirdly wasn't that big of a deal because he was so used to pain from swimming the 400 IM that like what's what's an appendicitis attack adding on to it and I'm just curious if you can at all understand what he meant by that and then also what is that you're wearing around your neck I'm like mesmerized by this star spangled necklace of yours thank you yeah so this this is just the design of our team's sweatshirt but um re referring to your uh your question about pain, I mean, um, I grew up, Bob, when we were in high school and, and even before that, uh, we had a rule where I had to do the mile every single meet until I was 18 and I could not stand that. And I was definitely a distance swimmer at that time. I probably wasn't even that great at a 4 a.m. Really all I could do was aerobic based stuff. Um, and I've done every single race that there is. I, don't do the 50 freestyle enough. I don't do hundreds of stroke enough, but when I do a hundred of stroke, I mean, personally, I'll go 100% from the start and I can really jump out unless there's a, a double before it and not really be too bad. And we do lactate testing and my lactate test, my lactate numbers after hundreds aren't very high. Um, a 4 a.m., a well-raced 4 a.m. can hurt like no other event. and. I think that's, I mean, the 4IM is such a unique event because I think personally it is more strategic than any other event. I think it's a race that needs more planning than any other event. It needs specialized training than any other event. And um, I was talking to one of the other coaches um, here who was getting my times on some, uh, we were doing an aerobic based IM set that was 4IM work on Tuesday. And I was consistently hitting the same splits on my breaststroke to, to the hundred or to the 10th. Um, I think it was seven in a row, um, uh, which I was then questioning whether his watch was correct. Um, but what, what I did with Bob from a very young age was every practice was focused towards the 4am. Um, every practice was focused towards negative splitting the second 200 with tempo on my backstroke, um, being comfortable not using legs on my butterfly. Um, even if it was a butterfly specific set, those sets were all with the focus of the 4IM. And that was, that's what makes that event unique. I mean, there's there's a lot of really great 4IMers out there, but if you really want to break into that world-class rarefied air of, I guess, say 407 or faster, 
that's how you have to train and that's and that's really kind of the mindset you have to have and you have to embrace the pain before I embrace and um, that's what I spent the last year or so doing um, I mean I've had races where I was more I was never really nervous for the race but I was more so nervous for the pain that was about to come and how I was going to feel the next day and um, that's really what the culmination of this this year for me has been was embracing that looking forward to that and um, that's, that's exactly how I am. I don't know how much longer I have of these left. I mean, this could be my, my I could have two four IMs left in my career. I, I don't want to say that for sure. Um, I don't want to commit to anything for sure. I could go longer, but, um, there's not too many left in, of those for me. So, um, I'm going to make every single one of them hurt as, as much as I can. And like I said, I'm looking forward to it. Last question, Izumi, go ahead. Thank you again. Uh, this is Izumi from TV Asahi again. This is a question from Michael. Um, a lot of the athletes are having a hard time training or like even in life in the past year with the COVID and everything, but that didn't seem like a case for you and you've been so successful even in a long course this season. So what's the secret behind it? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question and a hard one. I think it obviously depends on everyone's situation and I was very fortunate. Um, so my hometown of Encinitas, California, I, I live right on the ocean. And for me, the, the year that was COVID, um, I, I kind of stood back from swimming for quite a while. You know, I was, I was out of the pool for a few months. Um, I, I created community. I played beach volleyball with my friends, my close group of friends. Um, I surfed a lot. I started ocean paddling, cycling. And I think what was really good for me is being able to step back from the sport for a, a short moment was a bit of a, a needed vacation, a kind of extended period for me to get some perspective back. Um, and then following some racing at the end of the year, as things started to you know be more available, I, I came into January with the focus that, okay, it's time for my Olympic push. Um, and I was really excited because I had that time to look back and to, to kind of refine myself as a swimmer and understand that, my purpose and my why is is now in line and I, I love what I get to do and I miss the pool. And um, you know, after having COVID in December and recovering from that very easily, having no issues, I, I got into the pool January 1st and just grind, um, got back to work and very quickly got into a position where I was comfortable with racing and, and here we are on, on the Olympic team. And so, you know, we, it was hard. There were a lot of challenges. Um, we were fortunate to have some friends with backyard pools and we tried to figure things out, but we, we just rolled with the punches um, and understood that beyond swimming, um, we're too blessed in life to stress. I, I think swimming is something that a lot of us maybe get too, too focused on um, the outcomes and the goals and the, the shiny things that we forget to create community and love on the people around us because ultimately that's what lasts. Um, and I think having that perspective in that season is what's allowed for me to get back into a season of working extremely hard and punishing my body. And like Chase says, preparing for the hurt, because at the end of the day, it's, it's gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of pain, um, but then we get to celebrate afterwards. So that's, that's me. <laughs>